Hi, everyone. I'm Ian from the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. Uh, we're the group that has the observatory up near Ravenna. And uh, shame we haven't been able to welcome you there uh, for the last couple of months, but let's hope we can do that again sometime soon. Uh, normally when I talk to you, I, I, I talk about things that are a long, long way away from, from us here. And today I thought I'd chat a little bit about things that are really close to the Earth, like much closer than the moon even. So near Earth astronomy. And uh, to do that, we're going to have to go outside. So I thought I'd um, just review comfortable stargazing, things to do while, while we go outside. The biggie is dressing warmer than you think the temperature is. Um, I'll often have a toque on, even in the summer. I, I, you know, I count on one hand the number of days that I don't. Always bring your binoculars, that dim red light, uh, to see any star map you have. And you can do that just by taping a bit of red acetate over a flashlight. Some people even get a little flashlight and paint red nail polish on it, and that can work too. Um, a deck chair for the three things we're going to do. Deck chair is just great because you just want to you know, basically soak it all in. And a star finder. If you Google RASC, R-A-S-C, and star finder, you'll get that URL that's up on the screen there. And that can give you a chart to help find anything in the night sky. So since we're talking about things close to Earth, I thought I'd uh, also review the Earth's atmosphere and um, things that are in it that may affect what, what we're going to talk about. It's about 98% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, a little bit of argon, 0.04% carbon dioxide, sadly growing uh, faster all the time, faster than the plants can gobble it back up. Um, it does protect us from, light, uh, from things on, on the outside. It actually makes life possible. The atmosphere has, you know, makes atmospheric pressure and prevents water from boiling on the surface. It would do that even at room temperature if it were not for the atmosphere. And you know, when you look at the moon in this picture taken from some spacecraft, I don't know which, sorry, um, no atmosphere at all. And then it can be hundreds of degrees in the sun and minus a hundred and something in the shade. So our atmosphere also smooths out that temperature for us. Um, really quite a good thing to do. Um, uh, so what are we going to, to talk about into the atmosphere more is the layers of the atmosphere and I can talk about what, what we're going to see. We of course live down in this trophosphere here. Um, even the jet airplanes only fly about 10 kilometers up. This, uh, if I'm going to assume this is Mount Everest, it's kind of a little bit out, out of scale. I don't even think it's 9,000 meters up, but jet airplanes down there. We're going to talk a little bit about the aurora, which hangs out about 80 to 200 kilometers above our heads. Um, I will talk about meteors. They, we see those somewhere between 50 and 80 kilometers up, sometimes all the way down to zero. Uh, hopefully we're not under it when that happens. And also some satellites, and they generally are, are 300 kilometers and up. So that's like the near Earth, a little bit in the atmosphere, a little bit not. Uh, the transition between um, uh, here on Earth and space, which leads to the question, where does space start? And maybe I, I thought about that even more because of the, the billionaire astronauts that have been rushing up into space lately. Um, basically, it's where the atmosphere doesn't affect you anymore. So, you know, the meteor not burning up until it gets down to 80 kilometers or so, well, that, that could be a definition. Uh, the aurora much higher than that. Um, depending on the politics and the scientists who you ask, uh, there, there's a couple of different things. The, the U.S. says it's 80 kilometers. Um, the international community says it's more like 100 kilometers. Um, so, whoops. So guys like uh, Bezos and, uh, and um, the Virgin Galactic guy, um, gosh, I forget his name. There we go, Branson, Richard Branson. Uh, they got weightless. They got up to that high, but only just. They were suborbital flights. Um, so um, they're the space people. How do we go and watch and find satellites and things that are up there? Uh, this is a picture I took a few years ago at the observatory up near Ravenna. And I just put a telephoto lens on the top of my telescope and I took a picture of this globular star cluster. And I knew that the space shuttle was going to pass right in front of it. So all set up, opened the camera shutter and right on cue by the, the space station zips by. Um, as they go by, they take several minutes to cross over the whole sky. So it's not really quick. Uh, of course, there's no flashing lights on satellites. So um, you, know, you can't mistake it for an airplane, which moves at a similar speed, actually. Um, they do look like a star, 
that that's uh, that is moving. And dim star to bright star, the space shuttle is very bright, sometimes brighter than any star or planet in the sky. Um, and the neat thing about the space shuttle is is that uh, if you can follow it with your telescope, and I, I've done this on a few occasions, it's really not very far away. And the telescope will show it pretty much like this picture here. I've seen the solar panels and the and, you know and 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 all the the connecting bits and pieces of, of the space station. I don't think I could see Chris Hadfield waving, but I could sure see his home. So that's really neat to be able to follow that. All that is uh, is is great to say. Oh, you didn't happen to know where the where this space station was flying by? How do I find out? Well, there's a program that you can use to do that. It's called Heavens Above. Um, it's it's a program run by by science people. It's not a spam account thing. Heavens-above.com. Um, you make a free user account. You input your location and you say what object would I like to see. So I've done that here for Thornbury for the upcoming um, International Space Station pass. So what, what, what goes on is that the space station is over us for a couple of weeks and then not. It was last over us on October 8th, 9th night. And as you can see here, it's October the 20th before it comes back. And it'll be back for maybe a week and a bit. And you can go out and look at it and you can see that the heavens above will, will give you the date give you how bright it's going to be, remembering that the lower the number, the brighter. So, you know, a, a minus 3.9 apparition is quite a lot brighter than a minus 0 0.8 negative numbers being, uh, being less, the bigger they appear to be. Um, give you the where in the, the, the location of the night sky that it starts, where it's at its highest point and where it ends. So for this particular one uh, here, it's like it got southwest on, on the 22nd of October, 10 degrees up. So up in Thornbury, Meaford, that area, if you're facing the lake, to the left is where, where the, the southwest is going to be. The space station is going to rise, going to go almost over your head and set where the sun is going to rise a while later. So that's, that's a pretty good way to find out anything that's uh, satellite-wise up in the sky. There's many more satellites other than just um, the International Space Station. And it'll also let you print a star map, too, should you desire that. Um, so that's, that's satellites. Let's move away from the atmosphere down into the atmosphere now. We'll talk a little bit about meteors. Um, here's, here's a meteor up in the, the sky that, uh, that Kristen took a picture of. She's one of our astronomers up at the observatory, and she likes to do these self-portraits where she's in them. Uh, the light glow of Collingwood behind and in across streaks, streaks the meteor. So what are they? Well, really, they're just little chunks of rock, um, sometimes iron. Um, and they float out there in space and the earth literally bumps into them or they bump into us. And as they tear through the atmosphere, um, very, very high speeds, somewhere between 10 and 100 kilometers every second, they'll burn up and they'll burn up really quite quickly. And so a meteor generally lasts one or two seconds. You know, it hardly it's a lot different than, than a satellite. Um, and some people think, oh, maybe it's like a comet. But if the, you know, comets can be weeks to months in the night sky, whereas these meteors are just seconds. I know sometimes a comet look like, looks like it's traveling fast. And it is just not fast compared to where it moves in the night sky. Um, so what else? Uh, the light that comes from this meteor isn't the, the light of the burning up of the object as, you know, as much as, as rocks and, and iron burns. Um, it's actually the energy of, of the, uh, the, the friction warms up the air or makes it actually extremely hot and energetic for a brief second and the air glows um, and then it goes away again. So that's actually what we see. Sometimes the big meteorites like baseball and bigger, they actually can burn and, and you can sometimes see them grow brighter and dimmer and, and, and even have some colors of the, the material um, you know, being vaporized. So, but that's, that's rare. Usually it's, it's not that. Um, interesting. So uh, what, what else have we got to say here? Um, three names of the objects up, up in space. Um, you hear, hear things called meteoroids sometimes. That's the stuff that's just floating out there. We haven't bumped into it. It hasn't bumped into us, us yet. For that one or two seconds that they're burning up in our atmosphere, it's the only time they're called a meteor. And if they land on the ground, they're a meteorite. Um, 
interesting thing, you can actually collect meteorites. Um, yeah, you can go out in the desert and maybe, or, or maybe even Antarctica where, they, where they're easy to see laying on the ice and snow, but even in, 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 on your house, um, over the course of a, of, of a day, um, there's about 44 tons of meteor material, like little tiny dust and stuff that drifts down onto the earth from all the meteors get burning up. And it lands on things like the roof of your house. So over the course of several years, there actually can be a little bit of metal dust collect on your roof. So you get a bucket and you scoop up a bunch of the goop up in the, uh, in the, um, the gutters or maybe what's come out of the downspout, put it in a bucket, throw in some water, throw in one of those rare earth magnets that are uh, really strong magnets, stir it up like you're making a cake, maybe over the course of a couple hours, stir occasionally. You can pull the magnet out and sometimes it has little bits of metal dust on it. That's actually meteorites. So I think that's kind of cool. Um, two kinds of meteorites. The one in this picture here is a sporadic, meaning totally random. And then there's other meteors and you've probably heard of a meteor shower. You've probably heard of the Perseid meteor shower, which is the most famous one. Not because it's the best, but because it happens in the summer when it's all nice and warm and we feel like going outside. So what is with these uh, meteor showers? Because the sporadics is just, just exactly that random. So a meteor shower happens when the earth passes through a debris field. Um, what, what that debris field is, is things like comets and asteroids orbit the sun just like the earth does. And when a comet gets closer, some of the dust and gas and things um, boil off the comet. The asteroids will bump and grind into other ones and little tiny bits get knocked off. And all those bits follow the same orbital path as the comet or asteroid, maybe slowly drifting out. Sometimes the Earth will cross that orbital path and it does so twice with Halley's Comet. This is the last apparition of Halley's Comet back in the late 70s, I think. Um, and, oh no, sorry, uh, early 80s. Uh, and um, you can see that over two periods of time, they caught, the Earth passes through this debris field and it causes two meteor showers, the Orionids and the Eta Aquarids. And the Perseids here uh, cross, cross over at a different place just once. Um, the comets tend to recharge the, uh, the debris field and the asteroids sort of do the same because they're always grinded against each other. Um, sporadic meteors maybe are one every 10 minutes or so, and you're not usually looking in the right place of the sky. Uh, to see one every 10 minutes. I generally see one or two over the course of a night. Meteor showers can sometimes be up to 100 an hour, and, and that, that's rare, but it can. And, and uh, once, a long time ago, back in November 1833, there was what was called the Great Meteor Shower, um, and there were 72,000 meteors per hour. That's 20 a second. That's a real shower. That's kind of like what we're all waiting for. Uh, hasn't happened since then. Uh, will it happen again? Gee, I hope so. So what's with these uh, uh, names that appear a little bit like uh, constellation names? Because um, many of you might be familiar with the constellation Orion or Aquarius or, or even Perseus. Um, and what it is, is where the, all these comets appear, sorry, meteors appear to come from. This image is about a one hour long exposure taken about, what is it, nine years ago there. And it's of the Perseid meteor shower on, on one of the peak nights. And so what's happened is, is the stars are, are there and, and then it's collected all the various meteors that have happened over the course of that hour. And you can see that they all appear to be coming from this same place in space. Well, so happens, this is the constellation of Perseus. And that's why they're known as the Perseid meteor showers. Um, and of course, the Orionids appear to come from Orion. The Geminids appear to come from Gemini. Um, and so that's where to look. Um, when to look after midnight, um, the Earth, as it goes around in its orbit, it's better to have the daytime part of the orbit, sorry, the nighttime part of the orbit where the Earth is plowing through the, the space rather than following behind. And that happens after midnight when, when we... Uh, we start to plow through more. I mean, so there's more meteorites after midnight than before. You don't want the moon in the sky. I mean, we all love, love the moon at various phases, but not for things like meteor showers or deep sky astronomy or aurora, what we're going to talk about soon. Um, you want it dim because it'll wash out the, the meteors. 
you can go online and look at the, the Farmer's Almanac or some RASC websites, but if you Google meteor shower calendar, you're going to get a list of meteor showers for the year. And what I've done is I've created a little table of not all of them, but just some of them. And you can see that uh, they happen through various times of the year. The, uh, you know, the Lyrids in April, you get 10 an hour, sometimes 100, and that's around this date. There's the Perseids, August 11, 12, and we sometimes get 50 a night. The Geminids is actually my favorite. It's pretty reliable at about 75 meteors an hour. Um, also lists the comets associated with it and the two showers on my table here that don't have a comet, they're ones that are associated with an asteroid. Um, a little bit about the, the time visible. These dates are when the, when the peak happens, when the most meteors happen. Several days, even a week either side, you can probably still see some of the meteor showers. Um, and ever the, the pessimist or whatever the word is, uh, I, I didn't uh, really believe that she did they really all come from one place in space. So I did an experiment one day a long time ago when I was a young lad. I printed this star chart and I wanted to see if the Geminids were real. And so I printed the star chart and you can see I made it for 11 p.m. on December the 13th, 1993. Went out in the backyard with my toque and warm clothes and my blanket right over me in a nice comfy deck chair. And from 12 minutes after 10 to 12 minutes after 11, I faced towards a Gemini in the sky, like you would do for whatever meteor shower you're doing. And I drew every single meteor that I saw for one hour. I drew longer lines for ones that lasted longer. And I put um, brightness estimates, but you don't need to do that. And lo and behold, after an hour, all of the meteors appeared to be streaking away from the constellation of Gemini. So it really works. And I found that a lot of fun. Maybe that's something you can do as a family together one night, say next August when the Perseid meteor shower is coming, print up a chart, go out under the stars together. All of you can look at different parts of the sky and compare your chart at the end. Um, it works out really well. Sometimes the meteors do hit Earth and makes a big, big mess. Interesting, this crater here is in, is in uh, Arizona. It's half a kilometer across. Here's our cars in a parking lot. And the, uh, the meteorite that, was the, that made this giant hole can probably fit in the room that all of you are in now, like, like perhaps even in a small office, um, 50 tons. So 50 tons of metal easily fit in a little room. Um, the one that made the Manicoagan crater, a couple hundred kilometers in diameter, probably a little bigger, but still likely not more than 10 kilometers across. Actually, this one's probably only one or two. So let's go on to put what I think is probably the, the, my favorite near-Earth astronomy um, subject, and that's the Northern Lights or Aurora Borealis. This is an image I took um, uh, from, from our observatory up in Thornbury a few years back uh, in October when, when they're, they're, they happen a little bit more than, than other times of the year, but they can happen anytime. So what's going on here? The sun gives off a whole bunch of light, but it also lets go of a lot of charged particles. Um, positive charge and they, they flow away from the sun. Uh, the light comes 300,000 kilometers a second. So we see that after eight minutes, the solar wind, which is what we call these particles, it goes about 400 to 700 kilometers a second. So it takes a few days to get to the earth. So we can see the sun and know, oh, it's let off a bunch of particles. We, we know we might get an aurora in two to three days. And what happens is that out comes the solar wind and it gets trapped in the magnet that the Earth is, and it gets drawn down into the upper atmosphere where, much like the meteors, it excites the gas and glows, and it glows in these auroral ovals, both North and South Pole. So if we lived in the Southern Hemisphere, we might actually see some too. If we think about now, how do we know when this is gonna happen? We can, we can consult another website that's, uh, tells us all about the KP index. And this URL is a big one to go do. So just Google space weather predictions and you'll get what the current KP index is for the next several hours. And then, you know, scientists have looked and seen what's coming from the sun. And for us here in Southern Ontario, um, we need a KP index of four or five to, to go out to get a good aurora. So if you see it uh, three, just sleep in. Uh, if you see it at four or five, you see it at eight, make sure you get out there. And you can see that the, the KP index, which describes how much the Earth's magnetic field 
is disturbed by the solar wind. It gets higher and higher and the aurora, the aurora oval gets bigger and bigger, comes right over our head in, in the very energetic ones. So look at this alert. That tells you when, when it's going to happen. And um, so, so that's the geomagnetic activity. And we know where we are in the earth. Look north. So over the lake for you, that's usually the best place. Not always. I'll talk about that in a bit. Again, darker skies. Oddly enough, where, when the earth is near the equinoxes, near late March or late September, and, and now is good, even the next week or so is good, um, that's often best because of the position of the earth's magnetic poles compared to where the sun is. And then you look for color and you can see that um, aurora comes in these very distinct colors because it is the gas in our atmosphere that gets excited. Um, you know, everyday aurora, if you want to call it that, they're often green because fairly low energy particles can make the oxygen um, molecules glow a little bit green. Um, up higher, you often see red glowing oxygen as well, but usually the green blots that out. If you take a picture, you can see the red better. Really energetic aurora come out as uh, you see blue spikes and purple spikes. That's when the nitrogen starts to glow and they're the spectacular ones. So this is the little stop motion, mid, stop motion video that I've shown a couple times before. And this is the aurora dancing through the skies there. You can see it moving. Remember this is eight seconds of video, but it's two hours of time compressed. So the aurora is changing all the time. Um, same night, uh, a little bit more clouds had come in. I took this picture, satellite there, and you can see it's mostly green glow and you start to get that red above the, the cameras captured and my eye did not see that night. Probably the best display I've ever had was right over my head at my home about an hour from Toronto. And it was maybe about 25 years ago when digital cameras were in their infancy. And so the pictures aren't quite as crisp and clear as the other ones are, but this was right over my head, right in the trees in the backyard. And I noticed it by looking out the back window and seeing like who's shining the lights out there? And I went outside and it was just, the sky was filled with this aurora, with this beautiful um, purple aurora. I've never seen anything like it before or since. I don't know what the KP index was then, but it was right over my head. So I bet it was seven or eight at least. Um, fabulous display, really worth trying to watch that KP index and go, oh, let's go and have a look tonight. So. There we go, some near earth uh, astronomy uh, for you. I uh, hope you can find some time to get out under the stars. Uh, thanks very much for listening and hope to see you at the observatory again one day soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>